Greetings across the stars. This is CEO Slynn of the Galactic Voice, Central's top news reporting outlet. In an unprecedented and completely unexpected turn of events, the governing bodies of Terran, Wataf, Mick, Zatuk, Grat, Squilla have officially announced today that after several days of deliberation, have formed a united federation outside of Central's influence. Although a legal unification, many are questioning the pace at which it was formed. Fears of such a death order prominent force have also caused various governments to demand Central to intervene and dissolve such a federation. With me today is Central's own Cali representative, Ambassador Cheek Trasser. Thank you for joining me, esteemed Ambassador. The Maroc news host introduces, before turning to the Cali sitting in a seat beside him. However, it's clear that the Ambassador is in a different location altogether, as her visual comes from a holographic screen. It's an honour to speak before your countless loyal viewers, Chick Tracer replies, with a respectful bounce. You're too kind. We have you here today because you have been the one leading the charge to appeal to Central to intervene with this newly formed federation. Would you mind elaborating your point of view to the people of the stars? Sio inquires. Well, I'd hope most already understand the sensitive issues with introducing such volatile gathering. Are we honestly going to believe that such hysterically war-craving governments will be of any positive influence on the stars? They fought one another for generations, and suddenly they are the best of comrades? Frankly, it makes no sense for this to occur, unless they all have conspired towards an alternative agenda. The elderly Callie says. You believe they intend to wage a conflict against other species, if not Central itself? The interviewer asks, though it's more of an informed statement. For the sake of my people's Mother Moon, I hope not. But with the mere existence of this Federation, the power balance and dynamic in the universe is thrown completely to the winds. If they do decide to invade or annex others, it could result in the largest conflict the stars have ever seen. I especially fear for my own people's safety, as I'm aware that a Kali separatist leader was present in the talks. Cheek presses, with immense concern. Ah yes, you're referring to the runaway princess. She's no princess. Her corrupt family lost any right to the throne when it was discovered that they planned on eradicating the council to seize absolute power. Chocolata Motaz is a criminal and traitor to the Kali people. Cheek cuts off to clarify. Right. Forgive me, Ambassador, but isn't that criticism also levied at the current king? Instead of arresting hundreds of family members, many were his own children, he ordered that they be put to death without trial. There's many in Central who argue he is the one who sought absolute illegitimate power. Surely not all of the royal family wasn't in on this grand conspiracy that you claim? Sio points out. They all indeed were. And although it may seem harsh, the royal family had its own private army at his disposal. Arresting them would only encourage extended conflict at the cost of many lives. We were not looking to start a bloody civil war. So the king did what was necessary to save our people. If some members of Central don't like that fact, well then, they are free to announce that they stand against everything Central stands for. Just like every species, the Kelly people are free to decide and choose how we are government. Central must honour this, or prove they see every species as a mere vassal to their whims, Cheek argues, before glancing at the footage recorders, as though to put a nail in the topic. But couldn't it be argued that you are demanding that Central essentially do the same with this federation? Don't they have a right to govern themselves as they wish as well? That is very different. The people individually can govern themselves as they desire. I have no issue with that. But this United Federation is a blatant attempt to defy the authority of Central. Even if no war is to come of it, mark my words, we are witnessing the rise of a dangerous superpower that will plough through and bully to get their way. This is possibly the greatest threat to galactic security the stars will ever see, Cheek asserts. Moving on a bit, what's your thoughts on the Grat and Skrilla joining this Federation as equal members? There's nothing equal about it. They are fresh to the stars, and are being taken advantage of for their labour and land. It's only a matter of time before their governments are dissolved, and their peoples rendered to little more than servants. Central moves stars in order to call the trooper out on their horrendous treatment of the Squilla, and act to save them. But now, when it's a bunch of powerful death old nations, 
silence and inaction. It's astounding at the double standards Central appears to have, though I hope they will see reason soon. Well, there's certainly going to be time for consideration of such things. This Federation has already requested an audience with Central, in a few weeks' time, to officially be recognised and present an explanation as to why they have come together in such a short length of time. Who knows? Perhaps even your mind will change once they speak their piece, Sio says, in a tone that signified that the interview was coming to a close. Or they are waiting so long so that they can attempt to move this Federation along to further dissuade Central from interfering. Who knows what else they're plotting? If you ask me, it's nothing good, the Cali Ambassador replies. Let's all hope you're incorrect in that assessment, for all our sakes. That said, I still thank you for sharing your precious time and insight with us here a Galactic Voice. Not responding with her voice, Cheek Tracer gave the interview a humble nod before her projected presence flickers away. The aim of the viewing then centralises on Xiao Xin, with graphics beginning to scroll under him as he speaks. After our break, we will continue into a deep dive into Chakalata Motaz, before interviewing the runaway princess herself. But first, we will have a follow-up story on the disappearance of Kwepi Khan, a scarce central diplomatic agent that hasn't been seen for several standard days. After that, we'll be treated by the galactic renowned chef Ul Kool, owner of the famous tea rice establishment on Kaboy Station. She'll be walking yours truly through the process of making her famous Fran Art Tan Falls, while sharing her own story of encountering the runaway princess. I hope you're just as excited as me for the delectable food and delicious gossip. Shio signs off, before commercials take over the screen. Can you believe we're standing here right now? Simone says, as she pulls her stare away from the broadcast screen. I wouldn't have, but that was before I met you, Chuck replies, as she rests her head on the Terran's upper arm. The redhead half a silent flushed laugh. Come on. You haven't played any small part in all of this either, she points out, as she wraps her arm gently around the Cali to bring her in closer. The two stand in the Galactic Voices waiting room, as Chuck has previously insisted on being physically present for the interview, before taking their leave from Central. Sure, but you were the one who gave me the opportunity to play my part, and in many ways taught me how to play it, Chuck chirps. Well, I'm not going to argue with the outcome. Simone says, as she turns to look at the concessions and the few staff refreshing them. So, how much do you want to bet that there's going to be more questions about our sex life than anything involving the Federation or the situation with your dick father? She questions with an amused smirk. Chuck's eyes flashed as she stifled a giggle. Although I think we'll receive plenty of more serious questions initially, I'm certain they will shift to more personal questions to keep people watching. I don't mind, though. At least we're not being swarmed by reporters, and any declining of certain questions will be respected here, Chuck responds. If there's any questions you don't want to answer, be sure to speak up. I'll wait to stand a second or two for you before answering myself. Suddenly, there's a slight uproar of mumbling among the staff as someone enters the room. Chuck and Simone turn to only be slightly surprised by the Terran Union president, entering with two of her guards, who quickly but politely ushered everyone else out. Madam President, Simone greets. You have an interview too? Not currently, no. But I'm expecting a flood of them soon. I'm here to talk with you, actually, Simone Thatch. But now replies so as she stops within five feet. You and Chakalata Motaz here are departing from the CSH after this, correct? Yeah, we... Have a few things to get out of the way before, you know, Simone replies a bit sheepishly. So, this isn't me being arrested, is it? She asks in a bit of a jest. But now chuckles as she reaches into her uniform. If the circumstances were different after your stunt, perhaps it would be. But I see the reason as to why you did what you did. And thankfully it has worked out, so no. I'm here for quite the opposite, actually, she says as she pulls out two objects. One being a small black rectangular case, and the other a metal pill-shaped container. 
Firstly, the asset you introduced me to. I like to make a formal request to keep it with me, but just in case that is not a current possibility, I am prepared to return it. She presents the metal pill. The asset on our end will be replenished in no time. It's already been planned out. I encourage you to keep it, Simone assures. However, her eyes keep looking at the black case, knowing what's usually contained within. Understood, but now nods, as she puts the metal pill back into her uniform, then holds the small remaining case with both of her hands. I apologize that this can't be conducted until the Union is done weeding out his ranks, but... The two guards behind her assume the formal salute that Simone only really did herself in ship takeoffs and incredibly formal events. Their legs shift closer together, back straighten and chins elevate. Their fists make spiraling circles around the front of their chests, tapping down eight times before planting itself in the center in perfect unison. Taken aback, Simone twitches to return it. Before she can, but now holds up a hand and brushes off the area above the redhead's heart. As the elected president of the Terran Union, I hereby exercise my entrusted power to pardon all official charges against you, Simone Thatch. The Union recognizes you and your loyal service to its values and defense of them. We extend our formal and informal apologies for allowing room for such unforgivable injustice to befall you. You are welcomed back in Union space and will be granted financial reparation but now announces, as though conducting herself before the entire Union. As further recognition of your past service, and the continued service you've conducted after your wrongful court-martialing, it is more than fair to say you possibly saved not only the Union and its people, but many across all the known stars. It is of my opinion that you should be honoured by every nation, but I can only officially offer the highest of recognitions in the Union. With that, she popped open the case, revealing a decorated golden medal. Upon it is a depiction of Earth itself, backlit by a stylized star. Simone's eyes go wide, as she feels the air escape her lungs. Oh, Madam P President, I... I don't think I'm even close to having a earned... She stammers, as she starts to feel light in the head. In the thousands of years our people have lived among the stars, only four have earned this honour. Vermis has shown me much of what you've done, and although you didn't do it for the Union, your actions and determination to literally save the galaxy have proven you are deserving. But now assures, before picking the medal up from the container, causing Chak to practically catch the redhead from stumbling back. Simone Thatch, you are awarded the highest honour the Union has to offer. The Medal of Earth's Memory. You are the best of us, and you uphold what it means to be human. This medal is reserved to those who perform great acts, securing the future for our people. Although that future is still in jeopardy, you and your compatriots have given us the only real chance we have towards that security and prosperity. Congratulations, and on behalf of myself and the Union, thank you for all you've done. You've made your people proud, but if you don't mind me saying so, your father would have been the proudest of us all. The president pins the medal to Simone, before giving her the salute along with her guards. Simone stood trembling, as though she wasn't a beefcake tank of a woman. But her company patiently waits without judgement, as the redhead gradually collects herself enough to respond. He would have been so fucking proud, she nods, as tears roll down her face ruining her makeup put on for the interview. The memory of Robert scooping her up in a spinning tight hug after he watched her team win a non-consequential game of baseball. Up to this point, that was the most bliss and pride in herself she's ever had. Making her father so proud in that moment meant more than anything in the universe as she received it. She can only imagine the hug he would give her now, but her mind settles itself back into that specific moment as it's exactly what she'd want to feel at a time like this. With a shaky breath, she returns the salute, but instead of holding it, puts her arm around the cali next to her. Usually the recipients of medals are expected to give a speech, and despite having such a small private audience, Simone musters herself to keep that tradition alive. 
I am beyond honoured. I accept this and I forgive the Union, because I know who the real enemies are. But I'm... I can't forget, either. We were supposed to be better after crawling off Earth, and what happened to me proves that we'll never be perfect, and the Union is greatly flawed. Corporations might not govern us anymore, but we still find ways to allow corruption in. Sure, most nations, regardless of species, have that issue too, but none have to deal with all of our tendencies. I have hopes for the future, though. We may never get it quite right, and maybe we'll be our own destruction in the end. It has nearly happened several times in our history. But as long as some of us keep trying to be better, trying to do the right thing, and put down the worst of what we're capable of, there's always going to be hope for us. I won't re-enlist with the Union military, as I can't trust it the way I used to, but I'll still continue to do what I can until I believe I've done enough. For me, the stars, and most importantly, my family. I look forward to working with you and the Union, Madam President. She finishes, with another respectful nod of her head. As for my owed reparations funds, I'll inform your people where I want it sent. The President eases her posture from the maintained salute, granting her guards the moment to do so as well. Of course, and I look forward to working with the two of you. Once the Union cleans up its act, you can rest assured that we will not hesitate to make certain future plans with you and all associated, she says, turning her promising gaze to the Princess. You will hear from us soon, Madam President, Chuck replies, as she rubs Simone's back comfortingly. May the stars be with you until then. Very well, Princess. May the stars be with you as well, and congratulations once again on your engagement. Bernal farewells, before patting Simone on the shoulder firmly, before turning away and leaving. After a few moments, Simone sniffed as she examined her medal again. You knew this was coming, didn't you? The redhead asks with a small grin. Surprise, Chuck confirms in a whisper, as she moves around to give the Terran a proper embrace. Shaking her head endearingly, Simone just held onto her fiancé with the hug, subtly rocking back and forth. And welcome back! I'm Sio Sin of the Galactic Voice, Central's top news reporting outlet. Although I unsurprisingly couldn't match the professional chef herself, it was a swell time, and the food I managed to make under her guidance is getting rave reviews from those working tirelessly behind the scenes. The host chuckles, with other approving voices in the background. Now for today's main event. As promised, please give a warm welcome to my next and final guests, Princess Chakalata Motaz and her Terran fiancé, Simone Thatch. Welcome! The visual view fluidly changes to show that both Chak and Simone are indeed present, on a couch turned towards the interviewing host. Ow, oh, thank you for having us, Chuck replies politely. Hey, Simone says, as she gives multiple cameras a confused wave, unsure with one to be looking at. No, thank you. It seems your presence here has already done wonders for our ratings and viewership. I'm certain it's of no surprise that you have people's attention for a multitude of reasons, the host says, as he brings up a hard light screen. At the risk of sounding rather full of myself, indeed it's not a surprise at all, Chuck agrees. I bet it's fairly controversial as well. Yes, that is also the case, but rest assured, your voice will be heard. Speaking of which, we do have a very limited time, so would you mind if I jump right into it? Sure requests. Of course. We'll try to be clear and to the point with our answers. The Cali grants reassuringly. Appreciated. Firstly, can you elaborate on your involvement regarding this new Death World of Federation? That seems to have come together out of thin air. The host begins. I was there for many reasons. Reasons I can't quite divulge yet, I'm afraid. But rest assured Central will be made aware of everything discussed in those meetings soon. None are nearly as nefarious as the current Cali ambassador ignorantly implied. I assure you, Chuck answers. That's good to know. I hope that's the case. Is there anything you can share regarding the Grat uplifting and what led up to it? The people that attacked the Grat were monstrous evil people. 
and I am so glad that my associates and I were able to step in when we did. The Kali responds. That's the thing that's not understood quite yet. How did you know the Grad needed help in the first place? Why were you there? There have been some whispers of how it was rather convenient that you swooped at just the right moment in order to help and gain the fresh Death Order's gratitude. No pun intended. We were actually pursuing the transgressors from a previous incident. They robbed us of something too valuable to lose, so we went and got it back. It was by chance that their main base at the time was conducting an attack when we finally tracked them down. As for suspicions for doing what was right, I will point out that the Grats have been provided standard uplifting care and have not intervened with their appointing of leaders or overall decisions. It's very true we've received their appreciation and have benefited from it, but that's the nature of things. I'm just glad that the stars are accepting the Grat. They are a wonderful people, who will make many friends across all species. In no way would I ever consider restricting their growth in any way. Being uplifted under these circumstances, they deserve the best we can offer, Chuck explains. Such as joining the Galactic Federation this early on? The host counters. Yes. One can argue that joining Central is a much bigger step. A monumental federation in its own right. Although I can't go into details about the new federation I witnessed being made, I can say that it won't stifle the Grat progression in Central, and the Grat have received a fair agreement that will be announced for Central to see. Again, nothing as nefarious as what the Trooper Elite did with the Squilla. And before you ask, the Squilla have also been treated with the utmost respect, and an equally fair agreement. The Federation has private matters to organise, and sort out as one can imagine, but it won't hide its purpose, function or arrangement. If somehow a species were to be unfairly taken advantage of, I encourage Central to step in as well, the Princess says, with an earnestly firm disposition. All excellent things to hear. Now, shifting gears, your words on a particular podcast are well known at this point. Has anything changed since then? Specifically about your plans to depose your father without incurring civil war? Chuck takes an extra moment to think her answer out carefully. Indeed, they have. Since then, I've experienced quite a lot and have come to accept the fact that civil war may always be a likely risk. If that comes, then I'll do what must be done. However, I am still hoping for a more peaceful solution, or at least a less violent one. My confidence in that occurring has been shaken, but whatever happens, I can only hope to not scar my people further. She answers honestly. Would this Federation have anything to do with those efforts? Again, I can't speak on much regarding the meetings, but despite the pace of the Federation forming, my forwarded issues are not a priority amongst the sea of others that these once old enemies currently face in their efforts to effectively cooperate. If you're asking if I hope for military support, then certainly. But as you can rationally deduce, that was a long shot to even hope for. Chuck plays it off in a mist of half-truths and lies. Having been completely honest up to this point, she acts as though suppressing a tremendously disappointed tone. Tipping off her father and his forces into premature action wasn't the play quite yet, and so she knows to keep them guessing. But... Chuck speaks up again before the host can, as she stares into the camera. I'm not giving up on you, my people. I promise I'm doing everything I can, and I know it may not feel like enough, but I am my mother's child, and I carry the spirits of all my slain family. They push me every day to make things right, and although progress is not as fast as I'd wish, trust in me. Put your hope in me. Just like all in my past bloodline, I won't stop fighting for you. May our Mother Moon watch over you all, she says in her native tongue, before readjusting herself to continue on with the interview. All right, with the denser stuff out of the way, I hope you don't mind if we got a window into your day-to-day -day life these days. If you don't mind me saying so, it's clear from old images and footage of you that you've hardened while on the run. Did falling for a Terran have anything to do with that? Rolling her eyes, Simone is actually grateful to have her personal life brought up for once. The rising tension of galactic matters was starting to get too stressful. Chuck casually cuddles up to the redhead. Her eyes glowing warmly. Quite a lot, actually. She's told me that I have a strength in me that I couldn't see before. She told me how to shoot, 
protect myself, and has given me a lot of perspective I never received during my royal upbringing. Chuck admits. Have you always had a fondness for Terrans? Your studies before the travesty seem to indicate such. Do you have any other non-traditional tastes in a partner? Do you even like other Cali? Sio questions, as though he is locked and loaded with them. Chuck waits a few seconds for someone to interject before answering rather casually. Yes, mostly their cultures, though. Simone was the first I felt an attraction to, and I wouldn't call my tastes non-traditional. I just have a thing for strong, powerful, kind-hearted women, regardless of the species, I think. But Simone is all those things I love in abundance, so I won't be actively looking for anyone else anytime soon. I see, fair enough. What about you, Simone? That's right. Didn't think you'd come out of this without your own questions to answer, did you? The host teases. What about Chocolata Motaz do you find appealing? Other than her being a wealthy princess, of course. Simone reaches her arms up to rest on the top of the couch. Honestly? Even knowing the princess thing, I didn't want to pursue a relationship with her at first, she says with a shrug. Really? Why not? Did the sparks not fly right away for you? Not... right away, no. But... It was less about what I felt about her and what I considered appropriate for myself. As you can tell, I'm a big gal who can do a lot of harm to her if I wanted to. And of course I don't, but I'm aware that even by accident I could really hurt her. I guess I willfully pretended to not notice her obvious attraction, and my own in fear of that. I guess I didn't think it would work out between us. Simone answers honestly. What changed? Simone's smile grew, yet also softened. She saw me at my worst. She stood and sat by me while I was going through a lot of things. She made me feel... okay. Like I was... loved. There wasn't enough at first, of course, but... Damn, she knew what she wanted. Simone trailed off in a laugh. She was straight up with me, and although I was terrified of accidentally hurting her... If I got too close, both emotionally and physically, she trusted me, and so I decided to trust her too. That's genuinely very sweet, but what did you have to trust her with exactly? The host asks, both genuinely curious and fishing for marketable gossip. That I'm a good person. That I'm worth the risk, and I'm a person that someone can trust that much in. I mean, she definitely wasn't wrong. We hammer it out like feral rabbits on cocaine, and I haven't managed to hurt her yet, Simone said, with both looks of fear and humour from behind the camera. But seriously, she made me like myself again. Even more than that, she made me proud of who I am, and I can't wait to ride the rest of my life with her. Simone looks to Chuck directly, nearly blinded by the light coming off of the Callie's eyes. She leans in and kisses her, for the whole universe to see. Ah, oh, I wish I could pry in more, but we are running out of time. One more question before I send you off to whatever you're doing, the host says, as he closes the highlight screen. Do you think the galaxy should be more open to relationships like yours? Putting the princess stuff aside, what do you say to others seeking something like what you have? If it feels right and you trust each other, why not? Go for it. Just be educated before doing anything rash. It helps minimise risks and potential misunderstandings, Jack answers, before letting Simone send off the interview, in a Simone way. Whatever happens behind closed doors or spicy websites, as long as it's consenting adults, go fucking nuts. Do what Chuck said, of course, but come on. Do I have to say it? Attraction is attraction. Love is love. Fling is fling. All that jazz. We all have one life, you know. Might as well live it as well and fulfilled as you can. If others give you shit for it, I can promise you're not the problem. Their lack of understanding and basic empathy is a problem with them, not you. Got it? Good. Simone says, while pointing at a camera that she is 75% sure is the one trained in on her. We're rooting for you. She winks with a devilish smirk. Stepping aboard the quip chap, in what emotionally feels like months, Simone, Chuck and Droom are immediately face to face with the crew and kids. 
Jamie instantly wriggles free from Seven's loose grasp, and in two harsh flutters of his wings, crashes right into Simone, screeching in joy and a wet face of tears. Oh, my goodness, Jamie, you flew! Simone laughs as she hugs the poor boy. Ah, oh, I missed you guys too, buddy, she added, as Jamie bit her shoulder, causing his screeching to hilariously muffle. Turning her head, she can already see Chuck holding SJ in all four of her arms. Although the Wataf is much more reserved in their excitement, their rattling plays give away their internal feelings quite blatantly. Hey, kiddo, Simone whispers, as she places a free hand on SJ's head, feeling that they have noticeably grown despite not being away for that terribly long. Having been laughing since the kids bolted forward, Chuckno moves up to pat Jack on her back. I knew you would do it! <laughs> Both of you! All of you! I only regret not bearing witness to it all, plain out! <laughs> Chuck tightens her hug on her child, before leaning over for the captain to give her a fatherly embrace. We did more than that, Chuck Nuck. We did way more. So much more. I'm going to take my home back, Chuck Nuck. We have all the support we could ever need! The princess cries into the old man's shoulder. Chugnook's default red colour saturates as he pats his grasper on the Kelly's back. Of course you did, you're Chocolata Mortaz! You've done your family proud. I'm proud. You've come so far since the day we were on our own. Now look at you! He soothingly says, meaning every word of it. Then he finally looked to the harness mammal, a chack's apparent control. Is that a Terran dog? Oh, yes, this is Room, a gift from the Zartuk ambassador. She's a guard dog, but very sweet. I'll have to introduce everyone to her one at a time to make sure she understands who's a friend, Chuck explains. Chuck Nug looks down at the beast, who is taking her job very seriously, but not acting out in any aggressive way, as she can tell the Kelly is at ease by those currently around. <laughs> Brilliant! I'll be sure we order the right food for her, the old man chuckles. After a while of hugging every which way, Simone looks to the resident bot. Thank you for watching the kids. You're a natural, she says earnestly. It was challenging at times, yes, S, but I believe I fully understand, and while you enjoy being a parent, it is good to see e, you two again. I've made a feast of the ages to celebrate eight. Seven replies, as their free cranium lights rotate in a blinking pattern. Fuck yes. Lead the way, Simone chuckles, as she adjusts the toller she carries who was now curiously eyeing the dog at Chuck's side. Before following the excited bot, however, she looks down to Vin, who has been relatively quiet. Hope the kids weren't too much trouble, she says. Not at all. Well, them being even more loud and boisterous than with you around was certainly something to adjust to, but nothing that I didn't expect. Good to see you all back. Where's Mickey and Nodrin, by the way? They didn't decide to stay on Central, did they? He inquires. Nah, they'll be here soon. They kind of folded Troy into their relationship, so they're just spending a bit of time with him on the other ship. Along with a few extra hired hands joining Thorn's group, Simone explains. <laughs> of course, deviance. Finn chuckles slightly as he starts to waddle down towards the mess hall. I get my own room? And is big enough to fit a big boyfriend in too? Sola gasps. After Brandy opens the door for her. The room is, in actuality, the smallest in their ship, but to the Varouk, it's spacious as all get out. Sure is, but you gotta run it through Thorn first if you bring any cute boys on board, alright? Brandy notifies with a wiggling finger. Got it! Sonna agrees, before dashing into her room, immediately begging to sort and explore through everything. And no testing explosives in here. Brandy quickly says, as she sees Sonla unload questionable devices, to the immediate disappointment of the little reptile. We have a special room for that, the woman adds with a playful smirk. Want to see it? Sonla perks up, as though injected with ungodly amounts of caffeine. Yes! <laughs>